crunching uh, COVID statistics. Uh, let's get Dr. Peter Lombard onto the show uh, this morning. Good morning, Doc. Good morning. How you guys doing? Uh, we're doing okay. pretty good. Uh, how was your weekend? Uh, nice. Uh, a lot of time with the family. Uh, had a little birthday celebration on Sunday, and nice. Uh, we actually worked a little bit yesterday at the clinic, so um, a little more normal for us. But it was still, still a little bit slower, so it was good. Right. So, uh, what do you think of this uh, kind of a return to normalcy? I mean, I went around this weekend, and I I know it was kind of weird because the governor had put out a an, a a little graphic about the beaches are still closed. Uh-huh. And they're only open for individual use. Uh, but I don't know if, if all, you know, 2,000 of you guys were at the beach individually, but, man, it was packed at the beaches this weekend. Yeah, there, there were quite a few just down in front uh, in Aganyan Bay. You know, cars, you know how they pull up on the right. over the sidewalk and pull up close to the beach there. There are a lot of cars down there. How does that make you feel, Doc? Well, you know, you can kind of look and see what they're doing. And um, I... I have a feeling that, you know, just being outside in general, the risk is much, much lower. And I think we, we, you know, if the testing that we're doing is any indication, I really don't think there's a whole lot of cases out there. So it's probably reasonable to, to consider, you know, allow, allowing for more things like that, you know, and I think we're, we're moving in that direction. So it's kind of uh, the hard part is they, they still have an order in place. And, and by allowing people to do that, you know, it, it, the precedent is you're you're flagrantly allowing people to break, break the, you know break the rules and so that's the conflict that they have i think right now mm-hmm. um and the longer they they want to maintain uh too strict of rules they're gonna have to keep dealing with those type of issues right and then you saw the uh conversation i saw it a lot on the social media was uh, this weekend was why is ross open but not the beaches i mean and then and then people were showing wow. sharing these pictures of the line at ross uh-huh. Yeah, that was crazy. I mean, <laughs> yeah. are we just like out the window with the social distancing or what? Because that was nuts. Well, it was a long line, but I mean, I, you could see they were they were they were wearing their masks. Right. They were, yeah. they were trying to you know keep keep the distance from each other, and I think I think that's what matters. You know, it's 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 going to be pretty hard for us to have one of these big mass spreading events that that can really um, uh, turn us in the wrong direction because. People just have a, if you have a, just a, a, a sixth sense about what not to do now. I mean, you, if you were face to face with somebody and neither of you have a mask on and you're talking to each other for long, you're just going to say something's wrong here. You know, I, I shouldn't be doing this, you know. So I, I just, I don't think that um, that we're going to really be putting ourselves in a situation to, to have one of these types of events. And, you know, the, the biggest risk is going to be, you know, as many people are saying, when the tourists start coming back, you know, I think that's going to be the biggest risk now. Um, but, but even then, if, if people are have this sixth sense about what what situation is is going to be a dangerous one, or even people going back to church, I mean, I think it's I think it's a reasonable thing to do as long as, you know, they're keeping their distance and they're wearing their masks. You know, there's the uh, I, I've seen a few people post, well, if masks work, then why do we have to keep six feet? And if six feet work, then why do we have to wear masks? And that, I understand the sen- sentiment there, but you know neither is 100% effective. If you do both things, you're going to be a little bit closer to 100%. And so it's sort of you, you, it's this redundancy thing. You, you try to do it, you add add a few measures together, and you're going to be more effective than doing one of them alone. Um, and just being outside is an extra measure as well too. We know that with being outside, sunlight, the uh, the extra airflow, um, there's much less chance of transmission than if you're in a closed space. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on um, the decision not to um, reopen, I guess, dine-in services? Yeah, that that's a tough one. Um, you know, you're sitting down, your mask has to be off to eat. Um, so <laughs> I I think that the decision, it seemed like they were ready to go through with it, but then they didn't maybe because of those 11 positives. Right, and right. maybe it was it was just more important for them to make sure that they they did at least at least the right amount of contact tracing to be able to be sure that this wasn't a bigger problem so um you know how long how long does that take them to know i mean at this point since they haven't found anybody yet it doesn't seem like anyways as far as we know from that 11 cases it seems like it was just a really isolated um uh, incident and maybe even old uh old cases that were just potentially dead bowel fragments you know we've heard about that too 
maybe they were not even infective anymore. So as, if that's true, as soon as they are able to feel, uh, figure that out convincingly, maybe they could have gone back to the original plan and say, let's go ahead and just keep moving forward with, with the plan as we had uh, laid out for the restaurant. It's, it certainly seems reasonable now. I mean, you, uh, you take a place like Guam right now where we have the virus contained, I, th I think it's reasonable. You know, we need to start doing things a little at a time and showing that we can do it responsibly um, in order to get us back to where, where we need to be. Doc, going back uh, to the, the height, the peak of the, of the COVID, uh, you were one of these voices who said, hey, it's not going to be as bad as uh, they're saying it's going to be. Uh, standing here yeah. this morning, do, do you feel vindicated at all? Well, um, I, you know, I, you go back to those early models and, and you see, you see the crazy, just the crazy numbers that they were predicting and nobody wanted to believe. And I, I, um, you know, I, I had a hard time believing it at the time, but I, I could see what, how, how those models gave the numbers that they did. And, um, and I don't know, I have kind of mixed feelings about it. I mean, you definitely want, don't want to be cut with your pants down and, and, and not be prepared for, for something like that. But, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it was a little bit overblown. Um, but I, I can't say I, I, I disagree with, uh, you know, the, the way we've gone about things that, so, you know, even as bad as it was, maybe we, we could have done, done things even better. And, and if we had acted a little bit sooner, perhaps we'd be able to open things up a little bit faster too. You know, that's the other, the other side of it. So, um, maybe because they really, it really scared a lot of people to see those numbers. Maybe that's to some degree responsible for why we're, we're we are where we are today in terms of um, the containment levels that we're at. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, I think I think there's plenty of places other in the world where you can look at and say, you know, they they were kind of in the same boat we were. They were expecting massive numbers and things just weren't, weren't quite as bad. But then you have other places that um, obviously just are horrendous and and the loss of life and and you know you look at even. Brazil now is looking like a really bad hot spot and you know what what what's going on there and what what are the differences and to some degree I think some of them are are, are random you know um, you can get one person who just happens to be somebody who just spreads a lot more virus than, than other people and they put them in the right setting and the right time and the course of, of effectiveness and and it can just make a tremendous difference to how you know an entire city um, uh, does so um, yeah, I mean, I'm grateful. Obviously, I think we all are are grateful that, and we all have to feel extremely lucky um, in where we are, and, and and that things weren't worse than than they were for us. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get your thoughts on you know the governor's mm -hmm. physicians advisory group. They have recommended to the governor uh, to change up and and lessen, I guess you could say, a little bit the mandatory quarantine protocols for uh, returning residents of Guam, those that are, are p coming from Sinai and the U.S. mainland and they have the required tests uh, mm -hmm. that are certified, that they be allowed to home quarantine as opposed to serving their time over at a government uh, quarantine facility. Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's kind of strange that it's, it's taking so long. I, I don't, this recommendation, I think, has been has been circulating from the physicians advisory group for it seems like two weeks now yeah. or longer i mean like a really long time and i as the last i had heard from the physician physician advisory group said the governor sort of gave her blessing on it and it was going to public health for them to sort of figure out how they were going to implement it and um you know basically give their give their blessing on it too so why it's taking so long for them to um you know pass this as the as the new standard for incoming Guam residents, and and that's you know that's all they were really looking at. You know, it wasn't Asian travelers, it wasn't um, you know U.S. travelers, it was, it was Guam residents. Um, I, I don't really understand what 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 the holdup is. Um, it definitely makes sense uh, to to have the Guam residents be able to um, you know quarantine at home and, and get a test as soon as they can, and then be released from quarantine as soon as they get that test. So I definitely I think that you know most of the physicians are, are on board with that idea too. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder what it is then. Um. Yeah, I, I, re I really don't know. Um, logistically, I, I just don't know. I, I, I can't figure it out. Yeah. 
Well, you know, Dr. Hoa brought it up, uh, you're right, a couple weeks ago. He said that this was something they were going to uh, pitch to the, the governor, uh, an advisor. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they just feel it's a little too early to lift that, or, or maybe the they don't have the manpower to be uh, following up on everybody. Because if you think about it, I mean, returning residents, that could be 50 to 100 people we're putting out there in the community. But, you know, I, I just got another message about why aren't we testing people when they land at the airport? Yeah. Or, you know, so. Yeah, I, I think... I think if they're able to get this Roche, Roche machine they've been talking about, that might be something that's possible, or at least test them, and they can quickly get the swabs down to, to, to be run. But it's just the, it's the capacity, I think, more than anything else, that they can't do the testing. That's that's the way I understand it anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, you've got to be able to use the PCR testing, and, and even even with the ones that they have here, they're, I just don't think it's logistically possible for them to test. Um, uh, everybody quickly uh, at the airport. I, I think that's the limitation right now with, with the existing um, uh, equipment that they have. Mm-hmm. What do you think about public health's uh, expanded testing and the, the groups that they're targeting uh, in terms of like the homeless population mm-hmm. and the people that are in these uh, non-congregate or congregate uh, apartment complexes, uh, people that don't have uh, access to health care, as opposed to you know people uh, arriving into Guam? You think we're yeah. targeting the right uh, sets uh, groups of people? Well, yeah. If you've got the capability, um, well, you know, we're, I don't think we have a whole lot of people coming in, but mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I definitely agree with continuing to do community testing. I think, you know, the the value in finding a single positive is is huge. You know, so I, I think that since we have rather than have the testing sit idle. And we, if we have them, as long as we have the manpower to continue to try to search for these little pockets and see if we can find any, and if we can, then that's it's great and it's valuable information too. To say, hey, we, you know, we got this thing contained even better than we thought. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes to if if we're getting zeros for for a couple of weeks, and then we're and then we got more flights coming in, and they're not diverting some of those resources towards the airports and travelers, then you're going to scratch your head and say. Well, you know, we we know where the threat is now. It's more with the incoming travelers. So why don't, why don't we push our resources in that direction? Hopefully, that that's something that they would do. And hopefully, by that time, we've got even more equipment and testing capabilities to be able to maybe even do both. What about the the second wave, Doc? Uh, you know, earlier in our conversation, you had uh, th- we both talked about the kind of uh, doomsday projection that they put out. Yeah. Um, and so we're kind of they're kind of holding this second wave over our head. That being said, if people didn't really. Well, now they don't really take the uh, first projection seriously. How seriously are they going to take uh, it? What, I mean, is it going to be a case of the skies falling again or. Uh, I, I'm not sure what, the, what they're going to do or say. Um, I, you know, when you saw those 11 cases, I think everybody was thinking, oh, man, that looks like. That looks like the first week back in, you know, we had cases in March. What's going to, is, is the same curve going to come back again? And um, I, I've been sort of down on, on the second wave for Guam anyways. I just, and I think even for most places, I just don't think it's going to happen. Again, people are just, they, they act and behave differently around each other now. And they will for a long time until the vaccine comes out. And, and if that was sort of worst case scenario, nobody knew the virus was going around at the time. Nobody was social distancing. And look what happened to the Guam curve. And if that that's worst case scenario, because by the time the numbers started going up, we did start and we did change. So at this point, if, if you start to see a few more cases in the community, you know, we can't do any worse than we did before. And, and yeah, that would be, I think you could consider that a second way, but I think it would be a stretch to think our numbers would, would even be even be close to um, what they were before. I think more, more likely if anything, just little ripples here and there rather than a big wave, and, and we'll have little clusters um, uh, related to, probably related to travelers coming in, but I just don't, I, it doesn't seem very likely to me we're going to have a massive wave. Nice. Well, I hope you're right. Definitely. <laughs> uh, thanks, Doc, for your time. Anything uh, in closing you want to add here? What are you seeing with the numbers? Because we brought you on. We know that you're, some would say, a little obsessed with crunching the uh, the, the COVID stats, but I mean, what do you see? And it's kind of obvious, zero positives all the time, right? Yeah, I, like I, I said earlier, I, th- I think we've got this contained um, uh, fairly well. There may be some pockets out there still, some asymptomatic people that are still spreading it that, without us knowing it. And, mm-hmm. and that's why why the, the community testing, I think, is still going to be pretty important. But I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with, with how things look, and uh, hopefully we can keep this trend going. Mm-hmm. 
maybe if you could just leave us with uh, the importance and, and message about uh, preventative care and why that's yeah important. I, I, you know, just getting people back to the, to their doctors and getting and getting their care done. I've been reading all all kinds of stuff about uh, you know kids aren't getting vaccinated because the parents aren't, aren't are scared to go to the clinics. And um, uh, I've had lots of patients who stop their medicines because they've run out, their prescriptions have run out, and um, they haven't they've been afraid to come to to, uh, to our clinic. So um, you know, please go back and see your doctors. Get your your prescriptions refilled. Uh, what we don't want to see is, is excess deaths, excess uh, illness and mortality just because uh, uh, people aren't getting their, their routine uh, medical issues taken care of. All right. Oh, Thanks good a point. lot. Thanks, Doc. Is it your All birthday, right. by the way? Was it your birthday? It, w- it was. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Happy <laughs> belated birthday. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right, Doc. Take Bye care. Guys. All right, 651, uh, Dr. Peter Lombard, of course. I uh, love getting him on to get us.